Okay, um, I'll be presenting a, a paper that uh, Paul, Jim Roscoe, and I have been working on. Um, I'm an archaeologist. Uh, Jim is a cultural anthropologist. We uh, just presented this paper uh, in Vienna last week. Uh, I calculated, I think it's about 180 hours ago. <laughs> I was presenting in Vienna. And uh, it was the conference on hunter-gatherer societies. Um, and uh, we're, our mainly, as you'll see, is we're uh, going after perspectives th that uh, uh, people of culture anthropologists in particular have argued that warfare is a very recent phenomenon dating only to the Holocene. Uh, first of all, you guys have to get your time scale to match up with mine. As an archaeologist, I'm thinking long blocks of time. Um, and uh, I had the interesting experience of Douglas Fry and, and Brian Ferguson both being in the room. And after the talk was over, I was outside against the wall, and one of them was on that side, and the other was on that side, and they were having at me. So it was, a, it was an interesting experience. I'm expecting a more friendly audience today. <laughs> uh, now, uh, it, because there's so many things to cover, and uh, because Jim is more eloquent than I, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna read this presentation. So uh, it was timed in Vienna for 15 minutes, so I'm gonna stretch it out a little bit longer because we were going really fast. Most scholars are willing to concede that many human communities have been warring or at the very least feuding since the beginning of the Holocene some 12,000 years ago. There remains though considerable opposition to the idea that war goes further back in time. The current difficulty, most scholars agree, is that the empirical record of war prior to the Holocene is at best ambiguous. Several proponents of a short chronology of war though have gone much further. They are, I'm not talking about this book. <laughs> That's the opposite of what I'm talking about. Um, they argue that the absence of unambiguous evidence for pre-Holocene warfare is sufficient to conclude that in fact war was absent. Others contend that in the absence of definitive evidence, we should accept a non-warring scenario as the null hypothesis. In this paper, we argue, it is premature to conclude that there is no evidence for pre-Holocene war and indefensible to claim that the lack of unambiguous evidence is evidence of its absence. The likely forms of pre-Holocene communities, the probable morphology of their lethal violence, and preservation issues make it unlikely that the evidence could be anything but ambiguous. To advance the issue, we need to weigh and, uh, weigh and debate the evidence currently available, reserving judgment one way or the other until enough information is accumulated to warrant it. An initial difficulty in assessing the evidence for pre-Holocene warfare is that different scholars have different definitions of war. Several who favor a short chronology of war have advanced taxonomies that by definition characterize mobile hunter-gatherers as not warring. We use a more conventional definition of war as minimally coalitional violence launched with lethal intent by at least some members of one community against at least some members of another. Proponents of a short chronology of war deploy both the ethnographic and archeological records to buttress their position. Ethnographic arguments rely on a widespread assumption that pre-Holocene humans lived in small, low-density nomadic forager bands. Drawing on ethnographic descriptions of such societies, Raymond Kelly and Douglas Fry argue that while lethal violence does occur, takes the form of homicide, sacrifice, or capital punishment, but not war. Uh, since ethnographically known nomadic foragers lack warfare, they conclude, so too did pre-Holocene societies. Some scholars dismiss the assumption behind this kind of reasoning out of hand, at least where uh, war is concerned. For example, Trinkhaus and Bushilova dis dispute the analogical relevance of any Holocene analogy for the deeper past. Even if we accept the validity of the ethnographic analogy, there are difficulties with Fry's and Kelly's argument. First, it is simply not the case that contemporary and historically known nomadic forage groups had no warfare. Australia, uh, contrary to Fry's adamant characterization, harbored indiscriminate inter-community killing in all regions, as shown in recent publications by Allen, Gatt, and Pardo. Furthermore, other simple hunter-gatherers that neither Fry nor Kelly included in their surveys, such as the Ache, the Hiwi, and the Agta, appear to have warred. Uh, moreover, a recent volume edited by Allen and Jones, commercial interruption, uh, demonstrates considerable archaeological evidence that Holocene nomadic foragers also warred. If ethnographically or archaeologically known foragers really are windows into the past, as Fry claims, then it follows that we should expect a good percentage of pre-Holocene foragers to have practiced warfare. Second, Fry fails to consider a well-known bias in the ethnographic record of nomadic foragers. With few exceptions, they inhabited, inhabited and were adapted to some of the most marginal environments on Earth. 
To draw analogies exclusively from the sample, therefore, is to ignore the fact that the majority of pre-Holocene foragers would have inhabited considerably more productive environments. For example, some may, been, may have been politically complex, aquatically adapted foragers. The second evidentiary source that short cr chronology proponents point to is the archaeological record. Uh, there's a number of quotes there. Probably I would recommend the, the last one is the most um, telling of the point we're trying to make. Since the archaeological record provides direct evidence of human activity, not the indirect evidence furnished by ethnographic analogy, short chronology proponents can be forgiven a sense that the jury has returned and rendered an unequivocal verdict that prior to the Holocene, humans were peaceful. So we get views like this are quite common. Uh, nonetheless, this is a rush to judgment because it fails to consider a crucial question. If war was practiced prior to the Holocene, what are the chances that we would actually find unambiguous archaeological signatures of it over 12,000 years later? If the records for the pre-Holocene and, and prehistoric Holocene were approximately equivalent in scale and quality, then we could accept with confidence that the current absence of unambiguous evidence of pre-Holocene war really does represent the absence of war prior to the Holocene. However, there's no easy way to gauge the relative scale and quality of these two archaeological records though there may be some people in this room who can help us out with this. So uh, this is an opportunity perhaps for some collaboration. Um, intuitively, we expect the former to be deficient relative to the latter due to higher human mobility and greater impact from archeological site formation processes. Where the number of sites or the number of artifacts is concerned, however, the issue is more complex. Although pre-Holocene populations were smaller than those of the prehistoric Holocene, the pre-Holocene era lasted far longer meaning that there may have been a cumulative total of more people around to produce archaeological evidence. In the absence of any reliable figures on pre-Holocene population levels and given problems in reckoning rates of site degradation or disturbance through time, there is no a priori way of reckoning the relative scales of the pre-Holocene and Holocene archaeological records. Nevertheless, site inventories from regions with records that extend into the pre-Holocene era indicate that the former is markedly impoverished relative to the latter. A good example of this is Williams et al.'s chronologi chronological database for prehistoric Australia, which contains nearly four Holocene dates for every pre-Holocene date, or a ratio of five to one for sites. Reason and evidence in some cast grave doubt on any claim that had war existed prior to the Holocene, we should expect to find an archaeological record rich with evidence. If the comparative poverty of the archaeological record presents a challenge to, de to detecting pre-Holocene war, ambiguities in interpreting that record are an even greater impediment. Archaeologists have at their disposal six categories, or if you, if you will, correlates of evidence of war. The difficulty is that none of these unambigu um, unambiguously signals the presence of war, particularly for the pre-Holocene. So we'll, we'll run through this litany of uh, types of evidence. If pre-Holocene people warred, their armories were likely limited to daggers, clubs, spears, projectiles, and shields, with perhaps a majority of them crafted from organic materials that preserve poorly. The least ambiguous signals are projectile points tipped with fragile, detachable, or intricate heads with microliths or with barbing. Uh, you, you see the point there, get, excuse the pun, but uh, those Gunther points are real common in California. Most of us think that they're war points. These weapons have no obvious advantage in hunting, but they do carry a military benefit. By shattering on impact, they sow lethal infection. Even so, as the example of the microlith-backed aboriginal death spear in the bottom corner there uh, illustrates, the military function of these specialized weapons can and has been questioned. To date, no clear examples of fragmenting projectile points have been found in the pre-Holocene archaeological record, and precisely because they are fragile, this is hardly surprising. Absent the low probability event that a well-preserved example is discovered, the pre-Holocene armory is unlikely to yield conclusive evidence of war. Uh, ethnographically known nomadic foragers use their camps for just a few weeks before moving on, and if their pre-Holocene counterparts followed a similar pattern, they would have had few incentives to fortify their settlements nor would they have incentive to burn the settlements of enemies. If their enemies lived in rock shelters, the exercise would be even more pointless. If settlements were raised, the signature would be faint or non-existent after 12,000 years, and the evidence all been impossible to distinguish from abandonment, ritual burning, or accident. 
In more productive environments, pre-Holocene fortifications would be more likely, but they would also be more vulnerable to Holocene era disturbances. To the extent that forages are nomadic, their aesthetic life is biased towards ephemeral arts such as singing, dancing, and storytelling rather than painting or sculpture. Pre-Holocene foragers were therefore less likely to create permanent images of war than more sedentary communities. Nevertheless, a few Paleolithic peoples left a scattering of rock art galleries, and those at Peshmer and Cognac in France appeared to, to depict human-like figures engaged in what may be combat. In Australia, Pleistocene dynamic phase pictographs may also may show combat. These interpretations, though, are open to question. As Big Conkey point, points out, it is unrealistic to expect that we can securely capture the meaning of any image in the absence of testimony from those who painted it. For these reasons, short chronology proponents reject the use of pre-Holocene art as a signature of war. Several criteria must be, be, must be met before osteological trauma can be attributed to war. Partially or fully healed lesions, such as perifractures, could reflect unfulfilled lethal intent, but they do not prove it. Paramortem injuries provide more persuasive evidence that a killing occurred. There's evidence of this kind of trauma among Neanderthals, but critics point out that it is impossible to determine whether these injuries were accidental or the result of intra rather than intergroup violence. Furthermore, they argue, Neanderthals are not ancestral to humans, so whatever they were up to would have no relevancy to the question of early human war. Turning to recovered pre-Holocene human skeletons, a small set of instances do show evidence of possible lethal trauma. Estabrook has recently compiled information on 37 Paleolithic and 77 Mesolithic individuals in Europe with injuries that were likely caused by either blunt force or sharp force trauma. She found a statistically significant lower level of fatal trauma for the former. So uh, fatal violence seems to go up in the Mesolithic. Several researchers have gone further to claim that levels of fatal trauma prior to the Holocene were all but negligible. Ferguson employs Holt and Formicola's survey of European middle and upper, pale upper Paleolithic cases to calculate that less than 1% of them exhibit lethal trauma. Brennan's analysis of over 200 middle and upper Paleolithic individuals from southwestern France identified possible cases in 2.4%. Kissel and Piscatelli's more recent global survey of over, of over 2,600 pre-Holocene individuals found traumatic injury in just 2.3%. These data, however, need to be put in context. Not every killing causes skeletal trauma. George Milner points out, for instance, that only one in three to four fatal arrow shots manifest osteologically. The skeletal material in these data sets, moreover, is fragmentary. The, the proportion of it lethal injury is th likely, therefore, to be rather higher than 2%. Although there's wide agreement that these data reveal pre-Holocene killings, they do not conclusively demonstrate warfare. From osteological evidence alone, it is difficult, if not impossible, to distinguish war killings from hunting accidents, which are, are not unusual among historic foraging populations. In some authoritative surveys agree, the pre-Holocene osteological record demonstrates that humans were sometimes killed. It is difficult to say how they were killed, and there is no way that single cases can provide conclusive evidence that they warred. Here's some of that um, beyond death violence we were talking about. Uh, military practice frequently extends to trophy taking, mutilation of enemy corpses, and cannibalism. However, there are technical challenges in, in identifying these behaviors and there are other actions that might have generated them. Definitively distinguishing the osteology of lethal pre-mortem violence from post-mortem defleshing, dis disarticulation, and brain retrieval operations is difficult. A mortuary assemblage carrying, containing multiple individuals interned at the same time could be the consequence of a massacre in war. Other events, though, can also produce mass graves. In the small-scale communities that existed prior to the Holocene, however, the members of a community would have to be extraordinarily clumsy, exceptionally belligerent, or extremely unfortunate in their harvests or health for accidents, sacrifices, or intergroup intra strife rather than a massacre to account for violent trauma to more than a few individuals. I can't help but think that Monty Python could do an excellent sketch on this, but uh, maybe we'll get back together. Uh, the pre-Holocene archaeological record is notably devoid of any mortuary assemblages showing evidence of such trauma. On the basis of current evidence, 
The existence of pre-Holocene warfare should be taken as neither proven nor falsified. Short chronology proponents are right to claim that there is no hard evidence that war existed prior to the Holocene. But we should hardly be surprised by this. If war existed before the Holocene, we should expect its material traces to be sparse, inherently ambiguous, and unlikely to meet the high standards of evidence that critics demand. Setting strict standards is fair enough, but the consequences must be borne in mind. And one of these is what statisticians call the type two error. The stricter the evidential criterion, the greater the chance of failing to detect a very real effect. And the danger is compounded when the data are sparse and ambiguous. Put another way, the more demanding the stipulations that critics place on what they will accept as evidence of, of pre-Holocene warfare, the less plausible their claims that the absence of such evidence is evidence for the absence of pre-Holocene war. An alternative proposal from Trinkaus and Bushlova is no less problematic. In absence of definitive evidence to the contrary, they propose, researchers should adopt a null hypothesis that evidence of lethal violence in the Paleolithic was caused not by war, but by other lethal processes. Since every party to the debate accepts that war exists and has been endemic in many places and times during the Holocene, a null hypothesis that lethal trauma should be attributed to war in, instead of uh, other means of lethal death in the, in the absence of definitive evidence makes more sense. Suf suffice it to say, we insist on no such hypothesis here. We claim instead that nothing could be definitively concluded at present about the existence of war prior to the Holocene. In the absence of definitive evidence of whether or not war was waged prior to the Holocene, how should scholarship proceed? One possibility is to reanalyze existing evidence where new and emerging technologies exist to enrich our interpretations. Refinements in signature detection coupled with other signatures may help in some cases to tip the balance of probabilities one way or the other. Although there shall probably always be uncertainties about, uh, associated with the interpretation of archaeological evidence, there are ways of paring down the ambiguities. With respect to warfare, many uncertainties are generated by the existence of alternative non-military scenarios for particular military signatures. We suggest that future research investigate with what frequency these alternatives appear to occur. We, uh, we offer up here an example. Trinkaus and Bushilova defend their hypothesis that Sunghir one uh, from the upper Paleolithic site in Russia died in a hunting accident on the basis that hunting accidents are common among historic hunter-gatherers. And indeed, mortality rates from accidents were significant among pre-contact Tiwi hunter-gatherers, uh, the forest-dwelling Aceh, and among the Agta. And if the pre-contact Tiwi are our guide, up to a quarter of these accidents were we weapons-related. Yet the rates for warfare and homicide were all higher than for weapons-related accidents. On this evidence, we should conclude that Sungir one was more likely to have died in war than in a hunting accident. Certainly a life insurance company would interpret an actuary table in this way. So too we argue should investigators of ancient war. Thank you. Just really quickly here, so I'm gonna reiterate, uh, this is a wonderful example. My po the very last point I was making as I was going over time, which is we need a theory that explains when killing is the optimal social strategy rather than other forms of interaction. And that having that theory is going to be so much more of a valid way of knowing whether warfare took place in the Pleistocene. I'll just give you, a, this, this is my analogy. Suppose we wanted to know whether apples fell to the earth five million years ago. The really, really hard way to answer that would be to look for direct archaeological evidence of an apple imprint in volcanic mud that could be dated to five million years so that we have direct archaeological evidence that the apple fell. Another stupid thing, or I shouldn't say stupid, but invalid scientifically, is to see apples falling now and say, by analogy, this is our ethnographic analogy model. Since apples fall now, by analogy, they must have been falling in the past. The best way to answer that is to have a theory of gravity which says objects that have mass attract each other. We know apples have mass. We know the Earth has mass. So the only question left is did apples exist five million years ago? And if they did, I know for a fact they fell to the Earth even if I can't find any direct evidence and irrespective of the ethnographic analogy. So ultimately, we're back to the evidence is great. The evidence can be used to test the theories. 
the ethnographic analogies are going to give us ideas about how to develop the theory, but we need to have a theory of warfare, and I still haven't seen it. Any replies or other questions? All right, Anthony. I guess I have a question um, and a comment. So my, f my first question is you mentioned that you were accosted by Fry and Ferguson after this talk. And I'm just actually curious what the reply to this would be. Um, so if maybe you could just mention that really quickly. And then well, the, the comment, um, if I may, is just, uh, you know, we're talking about the lines of evidence and how do we know whether ancestral humans engaged in warfare. Um, but there's another line of evidence that we tend to overlook, and that's human brains, right? The design of human psychology. Um, and so we can, uh, we can form hypotheses about how humans ought to behave in warfare given that there was an ancestral recurrence of warfare, and if those hypotheses are borne out, and if there's no alternative hypothesis that's plausible, then that's evidence in favor of the ancestral recurrence of warfare. Well, I'll address the, uh, the Fry Ferguson. Um, the reaction was to both to this paper and to the book that I recently co-edited with Terry Jones. Uh, and when, when I finished um, presenting this paper, Fry leapt up with a copy of my book in his hand, which, which was good and bad. <laughs> I, mean, it, I think in the end it's good, right? All, all press is good press, right? So, but he, uh, he was uh, taking issue with, with our taking issue with his, his, uh, his research, and he was accusing us of a bad uh, methodology, essentially. Uh, but we think that um, our arguments are pretty sound, and we stand by them, as I, as I told him. But, but I did endure a period of, uh, of uh, attack from the peace the peace-minded uh, anthropologists, <laughs> one on each flank. It was rather interesting. Okay, we have time for one more question. Okay, so it sounds like you want to stipulate that the, the uh, pre-Holocene record is pretty sparse. But what I'm wondering is if you couldn't do something equivalent to sort of polymerase chain reaction and sort of amplify it up. And the way, I, way I'm wondering is, okay, it's sparse, fine. But if we look around today's world and try to find ecological factors mm -hmm. that make warfare more likely. And so we come up with sort of a set of ecological correlates or social correlates. Could we perhaps find that there's enough signal in the pre-Holocene data to find the same correlates in the existing archaeological record, as sparse as it might be? Uh, well, I think, I think there's a lot of potential, and the new, new technologies are really encouraging us. Just for example, in that volume I was uh, shamelessly promoting, we had a really neat study of uh, amino acids in, uh, uh, and trace elements in, in skeletons in California showing that skeletons of young men who were killed and dumped in mass graves were young men who were not from that area. They came from elsewhere. So we are, we are seeing some encouraging possibilities there. Um, but pro I mean, the likelihood of us finding evidence that's going to be convictable in court uh, is it's pretty pretty low probability. Um, I, think, I think Kim is right. The key is a, a good theory of warfare that really explains uh, uh, this phenomenon rather than hoping we're going to find conclusive proof in the past. It's always going to be ambiguous. I mean, the, the, the evidence we're getting, even from a few thousand years ago, is sometimes really challenging to deal with. When we go back beyond 12,000 years ago, it's a real challenge. But I haven't given up hope. And, and you know, we, another possibility is... Uh, uh, the sorts of things we're getting out of the eroding glaciers these days, like the Iceman. Uh, you all probably are aware that the Iceman was th had been through uh, many a war <laughs> and uh, probably even died from a, from a lethal injury that he received crossing the Alps. He, yeah, yeah he, fell on his, he fell on his favorite arrow. Uh, but uh, he only dates to the Neolithic, but... Um, you know, we are finding things in the, the reports I'm hearing, you know, just sort of these rumors of what's coming out from the far north are pretty exciting. So maybe we'll get lucky and just find something that's, that is really well preserved. <laughs>